Welcome class to the first installment of The Hound of the Baskervilles by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. Uh, I wanted to start by uh, just giving a little background to this. Um, what I'm going to do is talk about uh, certain things that happen in chapters 1 through 6. And what I did is I descriptively outlined uh, the chapters. In other words, uh, certain chapters go together. So chapters 1 by itself, chapter two by itself, three, four is together, and then five and six seem to go together as well, at least in, in, in my opinion. Uh, background of the Hound of the Baskervilles is written in uh, 1901. Uh, genre is a mystery, and I'm actually gonna turn the captions on here. That might help some of you guys. Let's see if that works. Oh, excellent. So uh, the genre is a mystery, and uh, the uh, narrator is Watson, and the protagonist is Watson and Holmes. Uh, the predominant protagonist is going to be uh, Sherlock Holmes, but what's interesting about Watson being the narrator, or it's written in I, he is the I uh, when uh, you see I in the in the book, is that he is not in charge, really. It's, it's Holmes is the uh, one who's uh, in charge. The setting is in 1889. Uh, we find this out when uh, Holmes looks at a date uh, on the walking stick and it's the walking stick is five years old. So he adds five years to that to, uh, to get the date of 1889. Uh, the setting is, uh, starts off in London and then moves to uh, the moors of uh, Devonshire, which is uh, where the uh, castle of the Baskervilles is. So uh, let's talk about the first chapter. The first chapter uh, is called Mr. Sherlock Holmes. And just as you might imagine, this is just setting up, hey, look how brilliant uh, Mr. Sherlock Holmes is. And so Watson and Holmes are hanging out in Watson's, uh, I'm sorry, in Sherlock Holmes's uh, office on 221 Baker Street. And this is a famous uh, address. Uh, you know, memorize this if you want to uh, win a Jeopardy quiz or something like that. But in any case, uh, they're focusing on this wa walking stick and Watson makes his deductions and Sherlock compliments him and says, oh, you're, you're, you know, my muse, you're, you're awesome, uh, Watson. But of course, Watson is absolutely incorrect. And so Holmes starts making his deductions and essentially contradicts everything Watson had previously said. And so uh, what he finds out from the walking stick is that it's from Charing Cross Hospital. It's probably uh, for a young doctor and the young doctor uh, left the hospital and uh, now has a practice outside of, outside of that hospital. Uh, and he even posits that the, the uh, doctor has a spaniel because of the bite marks that are on the walking stick and lo and behold wow he is right you know uh and uh, we know this when mr mortimer dr mortimer arrives and this proves holmes uh, theory about about the owner of the walking stick uh, dr mortimer is the uh, owner of the walking stick and just to make things a little weirder uh mortimer is a uh fr <laughs> phrenologist and he uh he says Wow, Holmes, you have a great looking skull. And so he compliments his skull and uh, um, it kind of kind of strange, but uh, it, it, it seems to work uh, for the rest of the novel because the novel ends up being kind of dark and, and, and strange as well. So uh, no, the use of I, as I said before uh, in the previous slide, uh, the eye allows us to kind of be with Watson and walk around with Watson. Uh, this is different than some of the other Holmes uh, novels that uh, that Doyle wrote. Uh, that use of eye allows us kind of stumble along every once in a while with uh, with Watson and uh, kind of makes us or allows us to have our own theories here and there uh, without being, uh, how, how should I say, outdone by by Sherlock Holmes. Chapter two uh, moves on to the curse of the Baskervilles, and the main focus of this particular one is a manuscript that it, that Mortimer is carrying, and this manuscript is dated from 1742, 
And what it does is it introduces the uh, curse of the Baskervilles. And this curse starts with uh, Hugo Baskerville, who's this uh, drunk and sex crazed guy. And again, this is uh, one of those uh, dark moments of the book. And uh, it, it really is a nod to the Gothic era of writing that was um, part of this, this era. Um, very Poe-esque, uh, if you will. Uh, it sort of references Marquis de Sade as well with that sort of um, sadomasochistic uh, uh, feel to it uh, because Hugo Baskerville is obsessed with one of the farm girls that are, that are around. And he ends up getting drunk and he, with his buddies, he kidnaps her, locks her up, and God knows what he's going to do to her, right? Uh, and before he can come up uh, and have his wicked way with her, she manages to escape, climbs out, and runs across the moor. Climbs out of his house and runs across the moor. Well, Hugo, enraged, runs after her, uh, makes a pact with the devil on the way out, like uh, the devil will help me find her, so on and so forth. And ends up, uh, he gets killed by this hound. Uh, to quote the book, a foul thing, a great black beast, ends up uh, ripping his throat out. Uh, and, uh, which is pretty cool. Uh, you know, uh, this sets up that kind of supernatural versus um, logic uh, theme that runs throughout the book, uh, supernatural versus logic uh, or the natural world, uh, will continue to be one of those themes, uh, throughout. So, uh, what we find out too, is that now Charles Baskerville, uh, took over and he was a philanthropist who made a bunch of money in uh, South Africa, returned, uh, was good to the people that were around him. And as his custom was, he, uh, would stroll along U Alley, which bordered the moors. And uh, he comes upon this hound. And so the theory goes, and he dies of a heart attack. Now, the papers report that he just dies of a heart attack. They don't really mention, they curse too much. Uh, they said he was tiptoeing or perhaps running. And so what uh, what ends up happening is that Mortimer really, his take on the curse is that it is definitely supernatural. That he saw the footsteps of a giant hound. And uh, what this does is it sets up the uh, mystery as well as the theme of supernatural versus uh, logic, reason, and the natural world. So uh, what Holmes will set out to do, Sherlock Holmes will set out to do, is uh, try to exhaust all logic before he uh, resorts to the supernatural. Meanwhile, Mortimer is always going to kind of lean on that supernatural, and thus the curse of the Baskervilles is this hound that's been hounding them since, uh, no pun intended, since 1742. And so now... Uh, Henry Baskerville uh, is taken over, and uh, that's the current uh, resident, or that will be the current resident, rather, of the uh, Baskerville Castle, or Hall. So, uh, chapters three and four are, start with the problem uh, and Sir Henry Baskerville, and in chapter three, Holmes immediately requir inquires more about the death, and he finds out that the hound never touched Sir Henry. It means that the how never approached Sir Henry, it never came close to Sir Henry, and this uh, is makes him question, well, why did he wait at the gate? Why did he do all these things? And he later talks about the fact that um, it looks or appears to be that uh, uh, um, the Baskerville ran away from uh, from his house. So he actually was running away from a place that could 
actually save him. So this is an interesting uh, twist that, that Holmes figures out. Uh, Mortimer reveals to Holmes that uh, really why he came to him, by the way, he called him the second best detective, which uh, is kind of funny. But uh, Holmes, uh, <laughs> he asks Holmes uh, what to do with the new heir who arrives in an hour, this new heir, uh, Henry uh, Baskerville. And uh, should he take him directly to to uh, Baskerville Hall or should he hang out in London for a little bit? And so they decide to hang out in London for a little bit. And Holmes wants at least 24 hours to poke some more, more holes in the story and uh, and, uh, and and so on and so forth. So uh, when we get to uh, chapter four, Henry arrives and right away things get weird. Henry has this anonymous threatening note. It says, you better stay away from the moor. You're going to die, blah, 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 right? And so uh, Holmes immediately starts uh, analyzing the note. He takes a look at the note, and he's like, this was cut out of the times, and therefore the person must be educated. And uh, he actually used nail scissors, and uh, <laughs> he disguises handwriting. And this introduces another... Uh, idea about disguised identity and later you see this too with the the bearded man uh so it, it introduces that idea of um of mystery essentially uh, and, and like a true mystery uh the true identities will be revealed at some point and so uh what doyle does here is he uh puts tension in the mystery by uh, people not knowing exactly what's going on or who's who and so on and so forth. So um, another weird fact pops up is all of a sudden Henry's boots, Henry Baskerville's boots, disappear. But not just both boots, one boot. And then later that boot is returned and then his old boot gets stolen. So uh, there's this whole weird boot thing going on. Uh, and uh, it, it continues into the next chapter as well. Uh, so uh, what Holmes ends up doing is he needs to figure out uh, or follow these clues. And so one of the clues, of course, is the uh, letter. And so what he does is he gets Cartwright uh, to do his dirty bidding, as most uh, upper-class Victorian uh, people do. They they send the lower class to, to do their dirty work for them. And so what Cartwright does is he uh, sets out to all the hotels, 23 hotels within the area, and he is going to bribe people essentially to look through the wastebasket for the lost remnants of the Times newspaper. And if uh, he finds it, of course, then Holmes will have another clue. So, uh, as they are uh, leaving uh, Holmes's office, uh, uh, they being Mortimer and Henry, Holmes decides to follow them. And so, he follows them and he notices that someone is following, uh, Hol or, um, following Henry and, and uh, Mortimer. So, uh, they get too close, Watson and him get too close, and uh, this bearded gentleman uh, figures it out, and he speeds away from, from them, and they lose the trail. However, uh, Sherlock Holmes is uh, smart enough to write down the cab number, and he finds out the cab number is 2704. And so, again... Uh, we are going through this um, idea of identity and disguised identity and supernatural versus the logic world, logical world rather. Chapter five and six deal with the three broken threads and Baskerville Hall. And so with the three broken threads, it starts with the register. What a register uh, is back then is back in the old, old days. Uh, what they would do is you would sign in at a hotel and you would sign your name and so on and so forth. And so uh, Holmes is, uh, lies essentially to the clerk and he says, uh, hey, I think I know these people. Can I look at the register? I think I know them. And so he 
uses deceit to find out he actually know, doesn't know these people. And what's um, interesting about this is that we learn that Holmes is not beyond using deceit or lying in order to get his way. So uh, kind of a interesting uh, maybe character flaw, if you will, uh, with Holmes here. But in any case, uh, he's not beyond using lying. Uh, they immediately bump into Henry, and Henry is ticked off. He's uh, so ticked off, he doesn't sound British at all. Uh, and again, it's the whole boot thing that I explained in the last slide. Uh, he, now he's missing another boot. He's missing an old boot, and all he has is his uh, the boots or the, the boots that are on his feet. And so he's uh, you know thinks the whole uh, hotel is a den of thieves, and he's all upset. And uh, so. What do you do when you're upset? You go get you go get lunch, and what happens is is that Holmes uh, starts asking about inheritance. He wants to rule out essentially reasons to kill the former Baskerville, and so he finds out that the Barrymores got 500 uh, pounds, and Mortimer got a thousand, and Henry uh, got the whole lot. He got 740 thousand uh, pounds, almost a, a full million dollars if you or million pounds rather if you. Um, if you include uh, the estate that he that he inherits as well, and uh, Desmond, who they also call a, a a saint, and he's an elderly gentleman, he would inherit everything if Henry happens to die, uh, because Henry has not made a will yet. So what they decide is that Watson is going to Baskerville Hall in Devonshire to be a bodyguard. Uh, he's going to make sure he has a gun, and he is going to watch over uh, Henry. So the key here uh, with this particular chapter is the three broken threads. And what, what Sherlock Holmes means by three broken threads is the three leads, the three threads that we're going to tie things together uh, with, as in clues, are broken. In other words, none of them work out. And so the first one is, is he sends a telegraph um, uh, to uh, Basterville Hall to essentially check in on Barrymore and make sure Barrymore isn't the one here in London uh, spying on them and and perhaps you know uh, killing the previous Baskerville for the inheritance and so the telegram comes back and uh, he is indeed there and then uh, Cartwright also reports that he found no cut up newspapers and so now that the, the case is cold and uh, they only have one thread left, and that is the cabbie uh, of t of the 2704. And lo and behold, who knocks on the door but cabbie John Clayton. And John Clayton is uh, wants to meet with uh, Sherlock Holmes face to face. Uh, he doesn't realize it's Sherlock Holmes, which is an interesting twist, as you'll see in a, in a moment. But uh, essentially, uh, he feels that Holmes uh, wrote a bad Yelp review. Uh, on him, and he's never had any complaints about any of his driving at any time. So he comes storming to the hotel to get face to face with Holmes, and uh, wonder and wondering what he did uh, to deserve such a bad review, essentially. And so Holmes said, "Oh, you're a great. Don't worry about it. Uh, here's a little bribery money. Tell me everything about the bearded man who rode with you, and when it, or uh, that you gave a ride to, rather." And so. Clayton essentially says uh, at the end, he said his name was Sherlock Holmes. And so Holmes is uh, flabbergasted and awed and a little bit amazed. And he uh, eventually states there, uh, there's nothing more stimulating than a case where everything goes against you. And so thus three broken threads. Uh, what's kind of funny about this is Holmes is actually got the better Sherlock Holmes. I forgot got the better of uh, somebody got the better of him, which is actually pretty cool. So, um, this just inspires Sherlock Holmes even more. So when we go to uh, chapter six, Basterville Hall starts with Holmes eliminating Desmond and making sure Watson uh, takes his gun and watches Sir Henry and also takes note of the surrounding neighbors and workers who have not been cleared uh, of any wrongdoing. Uh, as they're writing to, uh, write, writing to Basterville Hall, uh, they start noting, noticing policemen around with guns, and they find out that Saland, the Notting Hill murderer, has escaped. And so uh, this is kind of a obvious 
who did it kind of thing. Uh, you know, obviously this murderer killed the previous Basserville and is going to strike again. That That's what they at least want the reader to think, right? Um, but what this chapter really is about, it's really about setting the tone of Baskerville Hall and setting that kind of doom and gloom feeling. And so the tone breaks from that congenial uh, jargon that, that Holmes is always deducing, and it, it turns onto this dark and melancholy tone. And I'll give you an example here. Over the green squares of the fields and the low curve of the wood, there rose in a distance a gray, melancholy hill with a strange, jagged summit, dim and vague in the distance, like some fantastic landscape in a dream. Ooh, harsh. That's page 30, 39. Yellow leaves carpeted the lanes and fluttered down upon us as we passed. The rattle of our wheels died away as we drove through the drifts of rotting vegetation sad gifts as it seemed to me so we have a sense of death here and and grimness uh in cha in pages 39 40 and eventually the they they come to the hall where the house glimmered like a ghost at the farther end and this is on page 41 and henry uh proposes to put lights up he he thinks that's going to solve solve the problem and by page 44 um Henry says, my word, it isn't a very cheerful place. Uh, and so the chapter six pretty much just sets up that doom and gloom uh, more upland, darkness, you know, murder on the loose, <laughs> hound from hell on the loose uh, feel uh, of, the, of the book. And Watson can't sleep that night and at the by the end of the chapter he hears a woman sobbing and that's how uh, chapter six ends